Well, good morning, KBC. Welcome to our week three of the Believe series. If you have your Bibles with you, that's great. If you also have your Believe books with you, that is awesome. We're going to be turning to chapter three of the Believe books, but also if you have your Bibles with you, you can turn to Genesis chapter three. So um, it's a both and. It'll be page 47 in your Believe books. Excited about the journey, and I, I pray that you found yourself in a small group or at least trying to find a way to connect um, together with your family. If you're online right now, there's plenty of opportunity to continue to do that. If you haven't received your Believe books, they're in both lobbies. Just make sure you grab one on the way out um, and follow along with us. Again, in small groups, we'll be doing this and participating together. If you're not in a small group yet, for sure, connect with Pastor Kristen. Um, if you also want to just join my small group, we're meeting at 7.30, and it's just uh, show up if you can type of a small group it's uh, on zoom so you don't have to leave the house and uh, so 7 30 on zoom and i'll continue if you want the link make sure you just let me know but other than that we really want to connect you somehow to the believe series because of the vital importance it is to to follow along with these 30 principles that help us think be and uh, live like jesus or, or think be and oh my goodness help me out um I've, I've done this a hundred times anyways. Uh, these are the principles as a, as a Christian that we need to continue to follow along with. Um, shout it out if you remember. Think, be, and act like Jesus. It's obviously that I need to learn how to act a little bit more like Jesus. So I'm going to be learning in this series too. It's, it's a continued learning for each one of us. And for me, as a pastor, one of the things that I continue to learn is learning not to assume Right? And of course, we talked a little bit about assume last week. But for me, especially when it comes to preaching, I need to stop assuming certain things. You know, I need to also learn to stop preaching about certain things, particularly maybe even politics, you know, or the price of gas. I need to stop preaching about these ideas. Or I've learned this over the last seven years here at KBC to stop preaching about my hockey team, right? And I'm not going to mention anything anymore about, you know, standings or scores. I'll let you assume what I'm trying to say when I do this, that, um, yeah, I'm not going to go there anymore, right? I'm not going to preach about my hockey team. But one thing that is in, in assuming as a preacher, I need to stop assuming that everybody that's listening to me knows who Jesus is and has been saved by the blood of the Lamb. My assuming of that leads me in a direction where I'm just preaching to the sheep. But really, in the end, the message of salvation is is so vitally important to everybody that's listening. And you may have been listening to the messages that preachers and pastors have been preaching for, for several years, but you've never come to fully believe in the salvation of Jesus Christ. You know, you may have been going to church all of your life, And I need to stop assuming that you've made that decision at one point in your life to commit to him. So this belief series and this salvation is the idea that I believe a person comes into a right relationship with God by God's grace through faith in Jesus Christ. I believe that. Which leads to a key question. How do I have a relationship with God? God. I shared a lot of stats last week about, you know, the idea of, of people that, uh, that don't believe. And, you know, roughly 25% of, 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 especially Canada, you know, have no real faith in a certain God. Talked about the idea of 4,000 plus religions out there and believing that this religion we call Christianity is the one, that Jesus really is the way, the truth, and the life. And I shared several other statistics. But the only one I want to share with you today is this stat, 100% of all people born die. 100%. Everybody in this room right now, at one point, will call eternity their home. Now, salvation speaks into the idea that there's two eternities. One that leads to a life with Christ and God, and one that doesn't. My question is, where are you? Where are you? We live in a fallen world. And this fallen world, you know, we, it paints the picture all around us. We always ask the question, why would God let certain things happen? 
Why, why, why doesn't he just jump in and, and fix everything? The answer to that is because we live in a fallen world. And that's where the conversation needs to pick up when we open up the Bibles to Genesis chapter 3, where God plants two trees, the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. He sets these two trees in the garden to allow Adam and Eve to make a choice between living in a good relationship with him or to choose not to. God said you can eat of any tree, including the tree of life, except the tree of good and evil. If you eat of that tree, you will signal to me, God, you're not willing to embrace our relationship. And our relationship will, in fact, be broken. Again, God is stating that if you eat from this one tree, you are signaling to me that my relationship with you is not important to you. Genesis chapter 3, verse 6 to 7. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were open, and they realized that they were naked. So they sewed fig tree leaves together and, and made coverings for themselves. You know, as you read through this scripture, one of the things that I, I often wonder is, how did God feel when that happened? You know, I, I, I'm wondering that the instant reaction from Eve when she took that first bite and felt the juices of this apple or whatever fruit this might have been. Some argue it might have been a pomegranate. Some argue that it might have been a fig itself because, again, they took fig leaves maybe directly from the tree. Who knows what type of tree it is? But you know what it's like when you bite into that apple for the first time? The juices just flow and the taste, the senses, your taste buds just, just flow in, and, and you're, just, you're, you're hit with a multitude of feelings. But that multitude of feelings that Eve would have felt, if you think back to that first bite that she would have had, you know, how, how good it would have felt. But transition over to the feeling that God would have felt. That instantaneous hurt, the instantaneous pain. You know sometimes what it feels like. You know, maybe you received that phone call or that email or that text message or that messenger message or that snap t- chat message from someone that broke a relationship with you. You know, they said some things about you that that hurt. And that instant feeling that you felt when when, when you knew the relationship was over. You just feel that same feeling that God would have had, but just multiply that by an eternal amount of people that the relationship was broken by. That one bite of that apple or fruit by Eve would have changed the trajectory of history. And God's feelings in that situation. Was he expecting this situation? I'm not sure. The Bible doesn't really paint towards the idea whether God expected it or not, but what God did do, and he's done ever since, is he created this idea of free will. He gives them two choices, and he hopes that they choose the right one. But he doesn't want to be a robotic type of God where he says, you know, I'm going to create two choices, but I'm going to make sure they choose the right one. You know, and, you know, we do that with our kids often, right? You know, um, we, we put the cookie jar up on the top shelf, hoping maybe that they wouldn't choose the wrong option. And I know yesterday, uh, Bree is, is an awesome baker, and she, she baked us these pumpkin chocolate chip cookies. You know, she probably baked about two dozen of them. There's probably only ten left after last night. And when I woke up this morning, I recognized that I made the wrong choice And not only just choosing one of those cookies, not only two of those cookies, potentially, possibly three of those cookies. Now, the regret was happening in the morning, but in the moment, the choice I made brought pleasure. Same thing goes for Eve. The choice of eating this one choice fruit, she thought in that moment would be great, but when she woke up out of the decision, she realized that everything had changed And God finds them walking through the garden. And God asks the question, Adam, where are you? Got a hid because I was afraid. You know, 
this is so vitally important to each one of us because what decision that Adam and Eve made in that, that situation transformed every one of our lives, that when we're born, we're born into this. We don't have to be taught how to sin. You know, we, we, we as, 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 as infants know, you know, the idea of, of greed and, and desire and, and want, and that's why we, we often ch- turn, as, even as, as children, into, you know, the idea that you know, I'm going to cry for what I want, and, or, or, or just, just that's who we are. It's, we're not taught to lie. We're not taught to, to steal. We're, 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 it's an innate within each one of us. What I love about it is that, you know, God in this situation, although the relationship is broken, he, he, he banishes them from the garden. And the first thing he does is he, he, he clothes them. He clothes them with the skin of an animal because he has compassion on them. He doesn't want them to walk the world naked. He, he clothes them and shows Adam and Eve the first act of grace. The question is, where did this clothing come from? It, it was clo- clothing from the skin of an animal which signifies the first death. You know, pre-Adam and Eve um, biting into this apple or, or fruit, there, there was no death. But the first death occurs, and, and God clothes them with grace. And it would take the blood of another to cover the sins of humankind. Now, if you, you, you paint into that, it, it would take the blood of another to cover the sins of humankind. Again, recognizing the first... Um, knowledge of the fact that they were living a sinful life was the the recognition that they were naked. And so that recognition that they were naked, they needed to cover up. They chose fig leaves, but God says, you know what, you need to fully cover this up. So he gave them the grace of this one animal's skin to cover up their identification of their sin. The next story that is covered in chapter 3 of the Belief series is the story of Moses and the Israelite slavery in Egypt. You know, we've all been told the Sunday school stories, but we've ever, have we ever thought about the impact that it has on our own story of salvation? Turn to page 51 in the Believe book, or Exodus chapter 12. Exodus chapter 12, verse 21. Then Moses summoned all of the elders and said to them, Go at once and select the animals for your family and slaughter the Passover lamb. Take a bunch of hyssop, dip it, dip it in the blood in the, in the basin and, and put some of the blood on top of both sides of the door frame. Not one of you shall go out the door of his house until morning. When the Lord goes through the land to strike down the Egyptians, he will see the blood on top of the sides of the door frame and, and will pass over that doorway and he will not permit the destroyer to enter your house and strike you down. Which leads to this point, to have death pass over your home, you need the blood of the lamb covered over the doorframe of your house. To have death pass over your home, you need the blood of the lamb covered over the doorframe of your house. Bible talks about the, you know, the next, that evening or the next morning, there was wailing throughout the entire um, city, the whole, entire country of Egypt, because the firstborns had been killed off, except for the Israelites who had chosen to cover their door frame. Now, the Bible doesn't really talk about this, but I wonder about the Israelite families that had made the decision that we're not going to trust Moses in this one. You know, I wonder how many Israelite families said, you know what, I'm not going to paint my door frame. I just finished painting it white. Like, I just finished renovating my house. I don't want to put blood over my door frame of my house. Who is this Moses guy anyways? I'm not going to do it. I wonder how many Israelites actually made that decision to say, you know what, I don't believe what Moses is saying. It just sounds way out there. Moses is a crazy nut anyways. You know, who is this religious guy that's preaching all this stuff up here about salvation of the blood of the lamb? You know, you know, I don't, I'm not going to do it. Now, how many Israelites woke up in the morning and their firstborn was no longer there and then they believed, but it was too late. 
Of course, we know every Egyptian's family is the firstborn. Now, when I picture it as a Sunday school, uh, and I, like, I don't like the image of it, I always think about, you know, one, two, three-year-olds that have passed, you know, that have passed on in this situation. But it says the firstborns of every family. You know, everybody in this room is a firstborn, right? I always just thought about it as being toddlers or infants or whatever, but everybody in this room, picture it right now, the firstborns of every family, Right? It wasn't just the kids, it was the adults, even the grand, who knows how many, you know, death came, death has been coming, and death is still here in our lives today. And the only defeat to overall death is what God can bring in eternity. See, ever since that day, Passover has been celebrated on Nicene the 15th, or, you know, ever since. You know, for, for how many, many years, up until the time of Jesus, and even from Jesus till now, Passover has been celebrated by the, Egypt, or by the Israelites in the, in, the, in, the, in the movement from slavery into life. Let's fast forward for a second into the, in the New Testament. Page 54 of the Believes here, book. Page 54, or Matthew chapter 26, verse 1. And we begin to see, you know, where it all comes into play when it comes to Jesus Matthew 26, verse 1. When Jesus had finished saying all these things, he said to his disciples in in verse 2, he says, As you know, the Passover is two days away, and the Son of Man will be handed over to be crucified. As a disciple, you know, my mind at this point is... You know, I've been celebrating Passover for the last, you know, for John, it would have been maybe 16, 17 years. He was, he was probably a teenager at the time. For someone like Peter, he might have been in his 20s, you know, uh, you know been celebrating Passover for, for many years. He knows what it's like to go out and as a family. So, you know, picture the scenario like this. You know, my prayer is that next week I get to go hunting with my dad. Right, you know, sometimes we just go out and we just go for some partridge in the pear trees, right? We look for pear trees. And, and anyways, but for, let's, let's picture John, for the last 16 years, he'd been going out with his dad, you know, to get the Passover lamb for the family. And he, he, would, have, he would have experienced having to take the life of their perfect lamb. You know, and, you know as a kid, I kind of draw, you know, emotion towards pretty little animals, you know, like, especially sheep. That would have been difficult, I'm sure. Every time, every year, John would have gone out with his dad, and dad said, pick out the perfect one, John. The one without any blemish. Like, and, and John probably would have been like, it's, it's Susie, that one right there. Like, I mean, really, let's be honest. He would have really imaged, for the entire year, he would have been like, that's my favorite one. But we got to take this lamb, John, and we got to sacrifice it for our family. It would have brought a lot of emotion. So when Jesus is speaking these words, he's lived with these guys for three years, and John would have heard the words of Jesus going, the Son of Man must be handed over. And I think at this point it hits John, and he goes, all his memories of every Passover lamb that his family would have sacrificed would have now imaged into his best friend, Jesus. And he's processing it, probably. Jesus is going to be crucified on the same day as Passover. As Christians, we celebrate Easter at the same time as Passover. From the moment we have broken the relationship with God, he, he, he has been laying the foundation for the spilling of the blood from the blood of the Lamb to spare us. Key point on this, it can't be our own blood. See, if we shed our own blood for our sins... That's our death. It happens to each one of us 100% of the time. But when we shed our blood, we go into a life in eternity without Christ, without God. So as Christians, we celebrate this Easter identification of of the, the, the death and resurrection of Jesus. John chapter 1, verse 29. John 1, verse 29. The next day, John, this is John the Baptist um, a little bit earlier on, says these words, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin 
of the world. First Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7. Get rid of the old yeast so that you may have a new unleavened batch as you really are. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18 and 19. For you know that it was not with perishable things that such as silver or gold you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. Here's the key. To have death pass over your home you need the blood of, of the lamb covered over the door from your house. That's what happened, you know, at the Passover. But here's the key for each one of us that don't live as an Israelite in Egypt. For death to pass over you and have eternal relationship with God, you must have the blood of Christ covered over the door frame of your life. This is the key message of salvation. I spoke earlier about the idea of how many Israelites made the decision not to because, you know, their door frames were just renovated. I'm not going to bother with that. You know, I think that's the problem with a, a lot of us who come to church. You know, we go every Sunday because it's a religion. We were brought up in it, you know. But you know what? My door frame of my house, I like it the way it is. I don't really need to. God's going to save me anyways, right? Condemnation is the key word here. The word condemn it is used several times in, in Scripture, and the idea is it's about being judged. It's about being judged. We are all going to be judged by the perfect spotless lamb. And we're going to be judged based on, did you trust me enough with the blood that I gave you. I love the apple picking with my family. It's, I've been, we've been doing it every year. We missed a couple of years, I think, Bree, and I, um, you know, we regret the days that we might have missed apple picking. Well, we love apple picking, and I particularly love apple picking. We go, it's one of the things we do with my parents. We head down to their place, and there's a, an awesome apple orchard down there. And uh, they've got Honeycrisp down there, and, you know, and, and Macintosh, and Cortland, you know. And uh, I'm, I, I'm, I'm, kind of, I'm, I'm kind of a Cortland type of fan. I like Honeycrisp, but, you know, I, I find Honeycrisp don't last. I, you know, I got all kinds of reasons. I, I, I got some of the perfect, you know, I got perfect apples in my mind when I go apple picking. Like, I'm going to find the perfect one. As this guy that's six foot four, I don't need a ladder. It's pretty good. I can just, I can find. And I remember when Bree was young, Daddy, can you pick me that apple? She'd identify the perfect apple on the tree. She wanted that one. And I would do my best. And actually, I'd put her up on my shoulders, and she'd pick that apple. Right? That's the apple she wanted. And see, as human beings, that's, that's the way we live our lives, right? We, we, want, we want the nicest things. We want the best things. We don't want the blemished ones. This past time when we went apple picking, a, you know, a unique scenario was happening. You know, I noticed that the farmers were there. Um, and, you know, it, it was noticeable that they were farmers because they did, farmers that had come up as temporary workers from Mexico, so I was listening to them as they were talking in, in, in Spanish, and it was just, it was just a, it was, I actually really enjoyed just, you know, watching them interact with each other. And you know what the farmers weren't doing? They weren't putting each other up on the shoulders trying to pick the perfect apple, right? You know what the farmers were doing? They were down on their hands and knees picking up the apple. Now, for me, when I go apple picking, you know, we pick the perfect apples. Every one that goes in the bag is a perfect apple for me. Like, I, if it's got a little, you know, and I'll reach up, and sometimes I'll reach, and one will fall to the ground while I'm picking the other one. Do you know what I do with the one that fell to the ground? I leave it there. I mean, no, because it's got bruises. It's damaged. It's, 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 it's not worthy of my choice of apple, right? But here the farmers are down on the ground picking every apple, putting them in a bin. And what I began to correlate in my mind is that God isn't going after the apples that are on the tree, the ones that are perfect. He's, he's going after the fallen apples, like the farmers were. See, the key here is that Genesis chapter 3 reiterates to us that every single one of us is a fallen apple. None of us are hanging on a tree. 
We're all fallen apples. We're all broken. We're all bruised. We're all desperate for someone to come pick us up. But some of us live life like we're still in the tree. Right? But guess what? When Jesus comes around for his, 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 his children, he's not looking up on the tree for us. He's getting down on his hands and knees. He's picking them up. And you know what the cool thing about those farmers is, is sure, not all those apples will be sold in the market as apples in bags, pretty enough for each one of us to buy. I, I appreciate lately the uh, going to No Frills or Superstore and they have the imperfect apples. You know which ones? Those ones. I like those ones because I'm a frugal guy, right? Now, I would never go to the farm and you pick one of those apples, but I would be willing to pick those ones. But not only those, that the, these farmers are picking these apples up and putting them in bins. You know what else those apples are used for? You know what I like most about apples? Apple cider, right? You know there's no apples that go in apple cider that are perfect apples? They're all bruised and broken, desperate for a farmer to pick them up off the ground. See, that's the way I see this story. I am a broken, bruised, fallen apple, desperate for a farmer to come along and pick me up. Because every apple that's on the ground, by me as a you picker, has been condemned. Follow me? When I go to the apple farm to pick apples, guess I'm leaving all of the condemned apples, all the fallen apples, all the bruised apples, I'm leaving them all behind. But that's not my Jesus. It says in Romans chapter 8, verse 1, it says, Therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Just like those farmers, he sees those apples on the ground, all this precious apple cider, and he's going to pick everyone that wants to be picked up. Now here's the difference. Apples don't have a choice. Apples that are on the ground, farmers are going to pick them all up put them all in a bin, grind them all up, make apple cider. Every single one of those apples will be picked. But here's the free will part as human beings. Think of yourself as an apple, saying to the farmer, no, I'm good here, on the ground, rotten. I'll just stay here. Well, that's the choice we have. Do we want to be picked up or not? I think one of the most beautiful stories of condemnation about fallen people, about the fallen, you know, idea of human nature. As the worship team comes up, I, I want to read just one story to close off about one fallen apple that feels so condemned. You know, this story, when Jesus went to the Mount of Olives and, and dawn appeared, he said, you know, the teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery. In the law, the law of Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in, in order to have a basis of accusing him. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger, when they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, If any of one of you is without sin, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. At this, those, those who heard began one away, one at a time, the older first, and, and until Jesus was, only Jesus was left. With the woman still standing there, Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir. Again, picture the scenario. This woman on the ground begging for someone just to pick her up. To give her a life. To give her a hope. To give her a future. Jesus, like a farmer, bends down to all those apples. Each one of you guys standing here right now. And says... Neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. And I picture him grabbing her by the hand and picking her up and moving her into a life where she can be 
something special. Go now and leave your life of sin.